Welcome back to more Warhammer lore. Today I will be looking into the Dark Elves of Nagaroth. This will be more of a societal video, starting with the origins of the Dark Elves as a people, and then moving on to their societal structure, their government, their religion, and um, things of that nature. The Dark Elves, or Druchi as they are known, are one of three splintered factions that hail from Ulthwan, the home of the High Elves, and the birthplace of all Elves. However, the Dark Elves are particularly vicious and bloodthirsty when compared to their brethren. From the bleak, chilly lands of Nagaroth lies the Dark Elven kingdoms of the Witch King Malekith. A realm born from the depths of malice and hate, a kingdom that seeks nothing more than to despoil a world they believe loathes their existence. With malevolent eyes, the Dark Elves watch this dying world, knowing it is their birthright to rule all that, they're, all that they survey and those that live upon it are born to do nothing more than to grovel at their feet. However, to cover the origins of the Dark Elves, we must first start with their split from the High Elves. The earliest days of the Elves goes unrecorded even by their own chroniclers. They lived in contentment and peace on the Isles of Ulthuan and learned the arts of civilization and skills of magic from the enigmatic Old Ones. This paradise was shattered and the elves doomed to a slow dwindling by the coming of the Great Chaos Storm. The elves were relatively defenseless as they were a peaceful people until the great warrior Anarion came to his people's aid. It was through him that the warrior spirit of elven kind was kindled and it was Anarion who would rally the elves and teach them the ways of war. His heart burned with the dark fires of battle, and his prowess with blade, spear, and bow remains unmatched among the elves to this day. A beacon of hope, Anarion fought across Ulthuan, and in his presence the warlike nature of the elves was awoken. Though this was not enough to stem the tide of demons raiding through Ulthuan, and so Anarion, in an act of de desperation, threw himself into the flame of Assyrian in an offering of sacrifice to save his people. Miraculously, he emerged from the flames unscathed, and in fact was blessed by Assyrian with holy vigor, and his presence on the field of battle would both inspire his people and terrify the demons. Shortly after, he was hailed as the first Phoenix King, the reborn son of Assyrian. He took the Ever Queen as his wife, and they had two children. It was during this time that Anarion met Kalidor Dragontamer, a mighty mage that also defended Ulthuan from his home of Kalidor. The two were quick friends, but Kalidor saw that there could be no ultimate victory by war alone, and so devised a bold plan to rid the world of chaos forever. The Dragon Tamer and his mages would create a magical vortex to siphon away the power of the demons and return it to the realms of chaos. Anarion cursed Kalidor as a perceived traitor, for the magic and weapons the elves used against the demons drew heavily upon the energies of chaos pouring from the north. Thus their friendship was fractured, but hung upon a thread. Anarion then heard news that his wife, the Ever Queen Astriel, was slain by a demon horde and his children were missing. In a cold rage, Anarion swore that he would destroy every demon in existence in vengeance for his, their heinous acts. Though calmer minds counseled otherwise, Anarion traveled to the Blighted Isle and entered the Shrine of Cain, the elves' bloody god of murder. Jutting from within the black altar stood the weapon of the Lord of Murder, the Widowmaker. Spear of Vengeance, Sword of Cain, the God Slayer. It was an accursed weapon, and the moment Anarion drew it from the altar, he doomed both himself and his descendants. This would also be the defining moment that brought the existence of the Dark Elves into this world, though subtly at first. In the ravaged lands of Nagarathi, in the north of Ulthuan, Anarion set his capital and established his kingdom. To him came the most warlike and vengeful elves to serve in the army of the Deathbrainer. Through his despair at Astriel's death never abated, Anarion took a new wife to bear him a son and heir. She was Marathi, a seeress, who was also claimed Anarion rescued from the grip of Slaneshi cultists. Later legends say that Marathi actually bewitched the Phoenix King, though it will never be known whether this is true or if he simply did not care about her character or history. Marathi gave birth to a fine and strong son, and Anarion named him Malekith and took him as his heir. Hunting, dueling, and other blood sports became commonplace in the court of Anarion, and it was here that the most proficient warriors gathered to hone their skill in daily battles against encroaching demons. Nagarathi became a hard land, obsessed with war and death, 
and Calidor departed to find his own kingdom in the south. Much to the anger of Anarion, Marathi spoke to Malekith and taught him the secrets of rulership and diplomacy, even as Anarion taught his son his unmatched skills at arms and the gift of command. Malekith soon became one of Anarion's most deadly warriors and learned spellcraft from his mother so that he could wield fireballs and prophecy as easily as a sword and spear. It was then that Kalidor enacted the Great Vortex that would come to save the Warhammer world. But the Chaos Gods would not sit by and allow the spell to be cast unchallenged. And so four greater demons and a vast horde were dispatched to foil the spell and kill the Dragon Tamer. Anarion was forced to protect his former friend, and after slaying the greater demons and beating back the horde, the vortex was successful. It is said that after the battle, he flew with his dragon to the Shrine of Cain, and drove the sword into the altar. Then he disappeared, believing to have died from his gravest wounds. The demons vanished, and Ulthwan was spared. The elves thanked the gods and praised Anarion, and set about creating a realm of light and warmth to drive away the evils that had beset them thus far. A new Phoenix King was to be elected, and for some, the natural successor to Anarion was his son, Malekith. Having been raised in the court of Nagarathi, he was an accomplished warrior, skillful general, and powerful spellweaver. He asked that he be allowed to honor his father's memory, but there were many princes having heard the rumors of the dark nature of Anarion's court, that thought in this time of peace a more cultured Phoenix King would be a better choice to lead the elves in rebuilding their nation. It was then that Durthu, the mighty Elder of Ancients, was revealed to have kept Anarion's original children safe from harm in Athalorn, and brought back Malachus' half-sister, whom decided she was taking over the role of the Everqueen. To this end, it was decided that since the Phoenix King must wed the Everqueen and create an heir to the throne, that since they were related, Malachus could not be asked to become the next Phoenix King. Marathi was furious at this turn of events, and accused the princes of deceit and coveting Malachith's natural birthright. Malachith, to his credit, did not have an outburst, but begrudgingly accepted whichever decision the Council of Princes decided on, to which Belshinar was elected the next ruler of Ulthuan, and the seeds of hate were sown between the Nagarathi people and the rest of Ulthuan. From here, the story of Malachith and his mother Marathi takes many twists and turns, but I will not be covering them in their entirety in this video. I'm saving them for a more in-depth look into the characters later on in their own individual lore videos, so be on the lookout for those. So needless to say, Malekith was not happy, and through political intrigue, Slaneshi cults of pleasure, a trip to the Chaos Waste, and the death of a Dwarven High King, he finally just decided that enough was enough, and forcefully poisoned the Phoenix King. He then proceeded to slaughter the majority of the Council of Princes and attempted to take the throne himself by entering the Flame of Assyrian. Unfortunately for Malekith, the Creator God did not find him worthy and burned not only his flesh but his very soul. Through sheer will, Malekith managed to pull himself from the flames and was scooped up by his knights and taken to Marathi on the cusp of death. She saved her son by using her influence over a former smith, Aval, to forge him a set of armor in a blasphemous rite, and placed upon his body still hot from the forge. This is when Malekith, the prince of the Nagarathi, truly died, and the Witch King, as we know him, was born. From here the Dark Elves showed their true colors, and Ulthuan was steeped in a civil war that lasted hundreds of years ending in a climactic battle where Malekith nearly took the head of the new Phoenix King, Kalidor, and was thwarted by only the Phoenix Guard, who through their connection with Assyrian, rekindled some of the flames of their deity as they struck the Witch King and he was forced to flee the battle. With his armies decimated, he needed some way of recruiting an army out of thin air, and that's when Marathi convinced him to undo the Great Vortex. Now, I know this seems like a crazy idea, and I will be covering it in more depth in my later uh, Malekith and Marathi videos, but essentially, through hubris, Malekith thought that he could control the demon hordes being held in check by the Vortex and use them as a new army to wash over the High Elves in their decimated state by dominating them through his magic. Now, this of course did not go well, as he did in fact nearly unbind the Vortex, but was thwarted once again, thankfully for the rest of the Warhammer world, by the High Elves. 
However, this attempt at undoing the spell had disastrous effects upon the land, and it caused a massive tidal wave to decimate Nagarathi and parts of the surrounding kingdoms of Ulthuan. Many elves on both sides died in the flood, but the Dark Elves were prepared for this to happen and had cast enchantments on many of their high-ranking nobles' fortresses that allowed them through magical means to not only survive the flood, but essentially become floating fortresses, which we know now as Black Arcs of the Dark Elf fleet. Now, after being forced from Ulthuan, Malekith and his people were made to settle in what is now known as Nagaroth in honor of their former homeland, they named it that. Um, from here, we will move into the geography of Nagaroth and detail each of the cities that makes up the Dark Elf homeland. Nagaroth, also known as the Land of Chill, is a bleak and forbidding continent that is as for unforgiving as the Dark Elves who have made it their home. Its northern plains are barren and windswept expanses. Broken only by jutting outcrops of rock and magic stained rivers, the waters sluggish and black crisscross the ice fields, carving elaborate canyons and deep ravines into the frozen ground. Further south, the thin soil is more fertile, allowing sparse pine forests to grow. Here, the Dark Elves have huge plantations to feed the cities by slaves, who labor until they drop dead, their bodies left to nourish the barren soil. Nagaroth is located in the New World, far to the north. Its borders butt up against the Chaos Waste at the far north, and Lustria to the south, the home of the Lizardmen. For this reason, guard towers are built around the borders and are kept under a constant vigil. Few races could make such a, a harsh climate their home, but the Dark Elves have made it their own by using slave labor to build six heavily fortified cities. The first is Nagarond, the Tower of Cold, or the City of Cold. It is the oldest and largest of the Dark Elf cities, and quite likely the most malevolent place in this world. Its outer walls form an imposing circlet of black stone, and no place is less than a hundred feet tall. About the ramparts are set a hundred towers, each rising as high above the battlements as the walls rise above the bare rock. From these towers fly the Witch King's dark banners of flayed skin, severed heads and limbs wrought upon the spikes about the walls, grisly reminders of the price of denying Malachus' will. Behind its impenetrable walls, Nagaron rises high into the foothills of the Iron Mountains. The city is a jumble of mansions, barracks, temples, slave pits, and crooked alleys, all swathed in a perpetual pall of smoke. Worshippers of Cain tear beating hearts and tangled entrails from their still living victims, and cast them into the flame pits of their hungry god. Thus is the very air of Nagaron thick with the essence of murder. Few walk carelessly through the streets. Those seeking sacrifices make no distinction for rank or loyalty. Cain's thirst is satiated by both the highest of dreadlords and the lowliest of slaves. Murder and thievery of all kinds are rife for the Witch King tolerates any and all deeds, save for those that inconvenience his rule. Indeed, Malekith provokes discord, for anarchy serves to weed out the weak and thus makes his people stronger. To this end, he deliberately sparks contests that set one noble house against another, encourages revolt amongst the innumerable legions of slaves, and sets the hag queens of the murder cults at one another's throats. Such turmoil frequently leaves quarters of Nagaron in scorched and blood-soaked ruin, but the Witch King cares not so long as the feeble perish and the strong survive. At the center of Nagaron stands the Black Tower. No mere fortress is this, but a city within a city, a maze of palaces, ramparts, and towers, huddled within its curtain walls and jet from its sheer sides. Here dwell those nobles held highest in Malachus' regard, an honor that brings wealth and patronage, but also danger. The Witch King has ever been a volatile monarch, generous when fortune smiles, but unflinchingly merciless when all does not go his way. Nagaron's court is thereafter a place of rapid rises and descents. Few can play the game of politics for long and none who take part die a natural death. The next city will be Grand. Grand, the Tower of Prophecy, is the domain of Malachus' mother, the beautiful seeress Marathi. From Grand's pinnacle, sorceresses of the Dark Coven can see through the snowstorms that whip about the ever-shifting realms of chaos. It is said that the patterns of change therein hold the secrets of fate, that all the mysteries of the world are laid bare to she who dare looks. Every day, black-clad riders gallop from the Tower of Grand, bearing prophecies southward to Nagarond. 
These foretell auspicious mom moments in which the Witch King will meet with success or carry warnings of an enemy's growing power. Marathi's rules Grand without compromise and does not tolerate interference from the outside. It is one thing for the Hag Sorceress to support Malekith in his rule, but quite another for her to accept it for herself. The Witch King tolerates his mother's small rebellion as long as her tithes are promptly delivered and generous in scope. And generous they are, for the mines beneath Grand have ever been rich in gold, silver, and gemstones of all kind. Even after thousands of years, there remains enough wealth buried beneath Grand to buy the loyalty of every elf in Nagaroth. Grand is legendary as a luxurious palace of decadence, not just in Nagareth, but in many distant lands also. The tales are rendered all the more alluring by a law that forbids male elves from entering its inner sanctums, save at Marathi's decree. Those few who are admitted are at once the most cursed and blessed of mortals, for their lives, their deaths, serve only the hag sorceress's pleasure. For those who do not catch Marathi's eye, there is only a life of battle against the horrors of the northern waste. Demons, monsters, and worshippers of the Chaos Gods are drawn constantly to Grand and to the heady broth of sorcery and excess that flows about its walls. The defense of Grand is therefore a near ceaseless battle, yet the Dark Elves who defend the ramparts never consider desertion to softer lands. Captivated by Marathi's beauty and their own desire, they are as much slaves to the Hag Sorceresses as the wretches who toll in the mines below. Karen Carr, also known as the Tower of Despair, also known as the Slaver's Gate, can be counted the bleakest of all the refuges of the Dark Elves. The Citadel stands sentinel on the edge of the Sea of Chill, perpetually battered by gale force winds, icy rain, and tidal waves the size of mountains. Its folk can therefore be counted amongst the hardiest of the hard people that are the Dark Elves. Indeed, they have become so acclimatized to their frozen conditions that more temperate climates seem to cause them discomfort. Karen Carr is known as Slaver's Gate for a reason, for it is here that the great reaving fleets bring their living cargo. Countless thousands die as they cross the wide seas to Karen Carr, tortured to death for the amusement of the black-hearted crews. These are the lucky ones. When the survivors are finally unloaded onto the ice reef docks, they soon find that their torments are just beginning. There is no escape from Karen Carr. Harganath, the city of executioners, or the city of Cain, is a cursed place dedicated to the worship of the bloody-handed god. A madness overtook the city long ago, a thirst for blood and flesh that has ever since has only been kept in a basement by some of the strictest laws in all of Nagaroth. Only in Harganath are acts such as murder, thievery, and public debauchery considered to be crimes, a hard burden to bear for a people so steeped in thoughtless depravity. Worse, under Harganath law, there is but a single penalty for this infraction. The transgressor is led in chains to the summits of the high sacrificial pyramid and beheaded. There can only be one punishment in Cain's chosen city. Only the foolish or the clever of lawbreakers in Harganath, and it is not always possible to tell those two apart until the executioner's blade sweeps down. The truly clever have made an elegant escape long before this point. Now, Harganath is an extremely interesting place, and I will be going into more details on this particular city when I release my lore video specifically on the Temple of Cain, so be on the lookout for that one as well. Haggraith, the Black Crag, is a sinister and foreboding place, built at the bottom of a cold, dark canyon and completely surrounded by mountains of bare rock that stretch into the clouds. It is a city permanently in shadow, for no sunlight ever reaches its walls. Haggraith is a place of twisted and impossible architecture. Its eight black towers rise from the canyon floor like the ossified remains of some loathsome cephalopod. Between the towers are strung walkways, platforms and bridges of every shape and size. Some are fashioned with withered timber and soot stained bone. Others are crafted from jagged stone or woven from the silk of monstrous spiders. The larger platforms are so massive as to be towns and villages in their own right, and are supported by gantry works of iron and stone. It is upon these that the majority of Hagrave's citizenry dwell, crammed into crooked mansions of cinder block and fire blackened wood. The towers are home only to the city's most powerful dreadlords. Cramped conditions combined with the Dark Elf premonitory nature ensure that rivalries flare into violence with alarming regularity. 
Those who do not walk cautiously through High Grave's webwork of streets have their throats slit and bodies heaved into the morass of sewage and rotting flesh that covers the canyon floor. It is of note that uh, Malice Darkblade hails from Hagrafe, and through his series you get a very good look into Dark Elf politics and practices, which are extremely barbaric and cruel as fitting such a dark people. But he's also one of my favorite Dark Elf characters, so I thought I'd just mention that. On to Klar Karan, the Tower of Doom. It serves as the Witch King's chief shipyard, for it is here that the keels are laid for many thousands of raiding vessels. This is a more sprawling city than any others in Nagaroth, stretching from the banks of the Red Venom River up into the trackless pine forest of the Dusk Ridge. It is from these ancient woodlands that the Dark Elves harvest the black timber from which they build their sleek hulled ships. The Nagarathi do not perform this work themselves, of course, for such labors are considered well beneath them, but instead set thousands of slaves to the task. As the woodlands recede, their hearts torn out by hook chains or consumed by dark fire, the ever-expanding streets of Claren Car have spilled into the gap. Year by year, the city swells further, having grown fat on the labors of its slaves and despoilization of the surrounding land. Once there was but one great tower looking over the Red Venom River, now the Dusk Ridge bristles with jagged minerals. With each wave of expansion, new ramparts have been raised, not only to protect the city as a whole, but also to defend each tower from its neighbors. As a result, Clercron's streets are tangled and maze-like, marred by half-collapsed buildings, severed concourses, and entire districts buried forever, as newer and more impressive fortifications are raised. Clercron is also famed for its Beastmasters. It, this is where many long centuries ago, the Knights of the Hag Wraith brought the first Cold Ones to be broken, and much later, that the ferocious Charybdis of the Deeps were bent to the Dark Elves' will. Now Manticore pens, harpy cages, and other enclosures are as common in Clare Corand as the Temples of Cain. Both are now outnumbered by the pelt-draped shrines of Anathrema, for the goddess of the Savage Hunt has ever been the patron of the Beastmasters. Thus, when the armies of Claire Karan go to war, they go so in Anathrema's name, driving her savage children before them to break the enemy lines with tooth and claw. Now is a good time to get into the Druchi as a people. So the Dark Elves, not so unlike their High Elven brethren, possess a cold if not glamorous beauty, which only helps to hide the corruption and vileness which lurks beneath their skin. All elves are beautiful, but such beauty is different between the three races. The beauty of the Azure is one of light and glamour, whilst the beauty of the Azrai is feral and wild. Yet, the beauty of the Dark Elves is a cold beauty, being said to take a man's breath away, both figuratively and literally. No matter their allegiance, all elves are long-lived to the point of immortality, possessed of a self-assurance that falls short of other worldliness. They are swift of both body and reflex. Capable of an effortless grace that shames the most elegant of men, the Dark Elves deem that only they make full use of their natural gifts, for they alone of elven kind do not allow such concepts as mercy and tradition to shackle their deeds. Elves are cunning of mind and clever beyond the kin of mortals. Their every word conceals a depth of meaning that is altered wholly by the slightest change of inflection. Dark Elves in particular are adept at the art of twisting speech to serve their cause and can gleefully manipulate the emotions of another to whatever end best is their own interest. Thus do the Nagarathi make and break alliances in a careless fashion, knowing that their silver tongue can always be counted on to heal the wounds of the past. It is this more than anything else which renders Dark Elf society so opportunistic and impetuous. Now, on to their choice of language. All elves speak a single racial tongue called Eltharian, but the language has since splintered into different dialects, each representing one of the three races of elves in, their, in the Warhammer world. The Dark Elves of Nagaroth, um, in practice of actually distancing themselves from their former brethren, an old one, had developed their own language called the Druhir. It is very similar to Altharion, but they've made a few alterations to just basically distinct themselves. And now we move on to the actual society of the Dark Elves. The societal structure of the Druchi is extremely convoluted and in flux, 
as families rise and fall from grace regularly. The only constant is Malekith, the Witch King, who rules over the Dark Elves with an iron fist. He is free to make law or abolish it as he sees fit, and many Druchi have met a swift end on one of his many whims. Below the Witch King are a collection of lords and ladies, usually known as Dreadlords, that govern the cities of Nagaroth. It is of, of note that the Temple of Cain is held by the Dark Elf people as a source of leadership equal to that of Malekith, and even though relations between the two are mostly good, there is always that threat of the temple that forces him to take into account their counsel on the will of their most holy deity before making any decisions. For this reason, high-ranking members of the church would probably be right below these few chosen by Malekith in Druchi society. And then from there down, you would have the lesser noble families would take uh, precedence, followed by soldiers and guards, then the tradesmen, which are usually come in the form of flesh houses, um, produce managers, and slavers for the most part. There are others, um, but you won't see any farmers or the likes of that. And finally, at the very bottom run, you will have these slaves. And these slaves, in fact, are the backbone of Druchi society, and that Dark Elves, being a particularly bloodthirsty race, were in fact not capable of supporting their society upon their banishment from Ulthuan. Seeing how most of the original Nagarathi were actually soldiers and mages, no one knew how to actually build a hardy wall or even till fields, and so Malekith started the long tradition of raiding the lands of weaker races for slaves to perform these tasks for them. In fact, this brings me to the Dark Elf economy. Dark Elves have one major source of income, slave labor. Dark Elves raid all other lands, particularly Ulthuan, home of their enemies, the High Elves. They take food and treasure, but the main purpose of their raids is to obtain slaves. Slaves pay an important part in Druchi society as they perform the menial chores that an enterprising Druchi considers below himself. Slaves also make up the bulk of the ritual sacrifices to the god Cain, though sometimes Dark Elves make the cut as well. Dark Elves do not value their slaves' lives at all, and often kill one or two just to show the other slaves how brutal they can be. Slave revolts are rare and harshly suppressed, and due to the brutality of the Dark Elves, usually only the newer stock have the will to participate in any revolt, and the only successful result revolts usually occur at sea, abroad either the slave ships or the Black Arks themselves. In the former case, the surviving slaves tend to sail the captured ship to their freedom, and in the latter case, the slave revolt is usually focused on stealing a ship and escaping, rather than trying to take over an entire Black Ark. The Dark Elves take to the sea in their Black Arks, kept afloat by magic. The Black Arks travel far and wide to procure all of these slaves. Each Black Ark is home to a small army of Dark Elf raiders, and a small fleet of raiding vessels that use them as a hub. Um, these forces can be landed on any coast or any unsuspecting kingdom. Um, they perform a lot of lightning raids and can be off before the local defenses can be reacted to. Now, it is of note that these raiders usually do not do well in a stand-up fight. <laughs> and in this way, for hundreds if not thousands of years, countless millions of unsuspecting men and elves and dwarfs have been doomed to be slaves in Nagaroth, which by some accounts is a fate worse than death. I got off on a slight tangent there, but um, it is also of note that not all slaves in the Druchi economy are considered equal in value. Humans are like standard, they're the standard coins essentially, while elf slaves are highly prized, especially high elf slaves, as their flesh is highly coveted in lots of disturbing ways. But oddly enough, the most valuable slaves are dwarfs. For they are very rare captures, and often would rather die than serve an elf in any way. But the few that are taken to Nagaroth are used to repair the mighty cities and their fortresses, making them invaluable to the long-term sustainability of the Dark Elves to occupy Nagaroth, their homeland. Now moving on to their judicial way of like, crime and punishment. The, we kind of covered on this earlier, but the, as far as judicial structure is concerned, 
There is no one set law for the Dark Elves. Each city has its own set of laws. Um, though they are similar with the exception of Harganath, uh, which we covered earlier. But for the most part, Dark Elf law is what Malekith decides it is. And he has decided that outside of taking the life of one of his chosen few, very few things are illegal. Anything from murder to rape to stealing, I mean, nothing is technically illegal. This chaotic society is really held together by murder and the threat of murder. And so the Temple of Cain, home of the Cainite assassins, are both wealthy and busy. As often the rule of the land is what you can get away with and who you can eliminate to move up in society. Which kind of brings me into the Dark Elf religion. Now as far as religion is concerned, the Dark Elves are completely devoted to the Sithari pantheon uh, of the entire Elven pantheon, particularly Cain. Now for more information on the Sithari, I will have a link in my description to my Elven pantheon video if you wish to learn more details about each individual deity. But Cain is by far the most popular, with there actually being a Temple of Cain dedicated in the Dark Elf Society, and it holds a very prestigious place in society. But Eldrazer, Atharti, Hecarti, Mithlan, and Anathrema, and many others are all worshipped in Druchi's society. It is, however, illegal in Dark Elf Society to worship any of the Chaos Gods. Now you might be thinking to yourself, how could anything be illegal, as they seem to be worshipping these gods anyway, especially both Korn and Slanesh. And a few of the Sithari have the same qualities as many of the ruinous powers, and therefore it has been decreed by both the Temple and Malekith that worshipping the elven gods is acceptable, but any caught worshipping the ruinous powers will be put to death. This has led to many hidden cults of Slanesh. Zinch, and even Korn springing up in Dark Elf society, but they are constantly hunted by the Temple of Cain and their assassins, and the Witch King himself, as he has no love for the Chaos Gods or their plans for this world. Now, moving on to the funerary practices of the Dark Elves, it is said that the Dark Elves originally buried their dead, as was the tradition of all Elves, but due to their dark and somewhat ruthless nature, this has since changed. Um, there are tombs that you can find in Nagaroth that hold the original Nagarathi uh, that came over from Ulthuan. But since then, the Druchi have found it more beneficial to be cremated. I suspect it's because of the vast amounts of dark magic that is regularly practiced during their society. And so it is easily associated with necromancy. And this is also the case in one of the Mal Malice Darkblade series where he makes a statement basically saying that it would be easy to raise a corpse back from the dead and have them spill all their secrets to you. And for this reason, I believe that is why they mostly rely on cremation now. And also, as far as the dwindling race of the elves, moving on to their um, birth rates, the dark elves are doing slightly better than their high, their high elf and wood elf counterparts. This probably has something to do with the lack of quote unquote morals and the ways in which they engage in intercourse they do it the old fashioned way just like humans and so the birth rates for the dark elves are much higher than the other elves but they are still not a sustainable populace in the long run the only thing that's really keeping them together is the fact that they can live for so long and so their death rate isn't out competing their birth rate at the moment and that has been the Dark Elf Society. We covered a various amount of topics, all from their origin to how their society functions and your rank in society and whatnot. I feel like we covered a good deal of this. This is only going to be one of possibly three videos on the um, Dark Elves as a people. I will be doing an army video and an entire video on the Temple of Cain. Um, so look forward to that. And if you're still with me, Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate anybody that's viewing this content. If I miss something, uh, make sure to leave me a comment down below as long as it's related to the topic at hand. And that's going to be it, guys. I have been Jumbo Thick. Hope everybody has a good day. See you guys in the next one.